Well, welcome everybody to another HydroTerra webinar. Today's topic is PFAS Uncovered, Innovations in Mass Flow Monitoring and Management. We're lucky to have Dr. Matthew Eskeland with us. He's Principal Environmental Scientist at ADE Consulting. Now, Matt's situated at an airport in Adelaide and he's doing his best to present this live, so hopefully it goes well. We have had a couple of audio challenges, but many thanks, Matt, for taking part today. Before we get started, I would like to commence by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land, and for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Bunwarung people of the Kulin Nation where we are located today, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. There's a picture of Matthew. A little bit about our presenter. So Matt studied environmental engineering at RMIT and graduated in 2012. He was originally from South Africa. His first career was a professional lifeguard and he's told me on average they were rescuing three people a day in Cape Town. So good work there. Um, when he came to Australia, he did his studies at RMIT, then did some work as an environmental consultant for many years, uh, and also completed a PhD focused on PFAS kinetics and sorption. So a great grounding for today's topic. Matt is currently an environmental professional engaged in the contaminated land, resource recovery and circular economy sectors, specialising in the management of emerging contaminants. Matt previously led ADE's consulting group in their Victorian practice, which included a specialist business unit focused on emerging contaminants. Matt enjoys solving problems, challenging conventional approaches and being generally disruptive. It's interesting to hear that last one. We'll see how that plays out today. Before we get started, we love your questions. So please feel free to raise them. Use the Q&A button at the top of your screen and type in a question. At the end of the presentation, I will read those questions out to Matt and we will do our best to answer those questions for you. Why does HydroTerra do webinars? Well, we love sharing knowledge. We like to help facilitate education and we like to take an industry leadership position. And it's great to have presenters who are generous with their time and their sharing of their knowledge. So without further ado, I will pass over to Matt and hopefully the audio goes well. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I assume your comments about audio challenges was in reference to the sound and the noise behind me, not my funny accent. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway, so I do apologise. Massive flights just landed. That's going to be an announcement. If the pause if it gets too loud. But um, thank you for having me. And stuck straight in. So do I? Can I control slides from the side, Richard? Or? No, I'll, I'll oh, do the okay. slides here. Perfect. So, I mean, the premise of today's talk is really around uh, PFAS mass flow, but it's looking at innovation in that space. The premise is that a lot of our work in the sector is trying to stop PFAS from getting A to B, A being some kind of source, B being some kind of receptor. And if we can't really measure it, we can't manage it. Um, with there being so many PFAS and so many unique PFAS impacted matrices, uh, there's a lot of innovation happening to be able to measure those mass flows. So the goal of this was really to look at how do we innovate in the space, what are the barriers, um, and kind of recognize that measurement is the start of all PFAS management. Uh, if we're not measuring it, we don't probably understand the problem we can't actually be using. There's the objective of this talk, which is essentially, you know, explore the status of innovation in PFAS management. So I'm going to use an example from soil, I'm going to use another example from Compost. So, uh, which they maybe done a bit of a disturbance. They're not choosing two water examples, uh, but anyway, today we're going to soil. And, and then also just the different risk profiles of the maturity. Now, it's not to be meant to be a final, it's meant to be a final, but this is one of the 
uh, issues with being a chemist is occasionally you get strange results in your presentations about chemical names. Yes, that's a factor that comes in with proportionality in regards to dipropanate. Uh, so that was presented in one of the presentations yesterday. Next slide. So talking about soil assessment and management, uh, we have, as far as PFAS is concerned, the best or um, respectively a lot of information uh, around how to manage PFAS. So right at the states and federal level, uh, we've got protection limits that we should be using, but PFAS management covers off some sampling methods and recommended analytical techniques. And we've also got uh, our state-based guidelines for soil reuse in most states. So why am I kind of floating this yesterday all related to PFAS, PFHSS, and PFO and attempt to roughly ignore the rest of the PFAS species that are out there? But because we have this understanding of what we're required to do, it fosters a, a, a sense of innovation where we know where the goalposts are and we can look for better ways to achieve better outcomes. So I'm going to give an example of PLCMS on the next slide. So initially, you know, traditionally you collect your labs in the field, you take them to, sorry, your samples, you take them to a lab uh, and you have them analyzed and then you go through the uh, your turnaround time is to receive your results. Uh, that works great, um, but some sites are very big, very remote, or they have some kind of temporal factor that needs to be considered. So that temporal factor might be that there's a wet season and a dry season. Uh, it might be that you are monitoring water in a drainage and it can run straight out of the rain. Apologies for a crying child they to me as well, so getting noisy. Um, so that kind of necessitated us to innovate a different way to monitor when we couldn't be waiting a day or even five days uh, for our results. So portable LCMS is a technique, it's a portable mass spectrometer that essentially can be used to measure PFAS in the field, not only report results on the same day, uh, but also report them every 20 minutes. So what this means is we're doing something like source tracking, emergency and spill response. You can go out to the field, deploy, run samples with them now, and every 20 minutes get a result. So it allows you to trace things up waterways, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we've done some field trials with this recently. Um, without going too deep into the concept, the initial trial was a car park trial. We basically went and parked our lab next to another lab, and we ran some samples and compared what results we got in 20 minutes compared to what they got in a one-day trial. Uh, sorry, one-day trial. So I'll give some examples. So we can head on to the next slide. And then we've also done some field trials. I've used a soil example here, but uh, recently we were on a airport. Um, and what we did was we wanted to trial our mobile lab same day uh, across some uh, sample delineation work at a variety of concentrations ranging from just above the detection limits all the way to many thousands of milligrams per kilogram. So right up there where you know, start to uh, really challenge what the instrument can do from a suppression kind of perspective. Um, so here we looked at an evaporation pond, a soil stockpile, as well as an empty paddock that was going to be developed. Um, the plan with the empty paddock was probably the thing that gets me most excited. Yes, it's nice having the results fast. Yes, it's nice doing source tracing, but the instrument allows one new thing that we couldn't do before. And that particular thing is that you can now go to site, collect some samples in the morning, say 20, and then look at those results to choose where you take your next 20 samples the same day. So you can actually develop a conceptual site model on site and validate it on site. So you use the first set of data to guide where you get your next set of data in the day. Previously, you'd have to go to sites, collect your samples, wait for the results, interpret the data, and then revisit the site to achieve this. So this is kind of a really cool, novel thing that you can do with this instrument. Richard, can you still hear me well enough? Yep, it is coming in and out a bit, but it's not too bad. If you keep your head close to your computer, I think it's okay. All right, All right. I'll uh, stay very close. Next slide, thanks. <laughs> thanks. So looking at the results, these are the interlab results between uh, the portable LCMS and the uh, commercial lab in the car park trial. So what you can see here is for the range of PFAS species we tested, uh, the results were fairly comparable between the two labs. Now, I do know there are two different scales, which any uh, 
shrewd person would probably swim that against the two different results and go nuts if those aren't the same scales. But mag magnitudinally, uh, the results were very, very similar. So we did get suppression on some and, uh, and the other results, our, uh, our, our results were below the detection limits. So after this initial trial, we really worked on trying to get our detection limit low and we can head over to the next slide. So on the airport trial, um, we, we went and did the same assessment. All we found is we got really high agreement for PFOS, PFO, and PFHXS, and PFHXA, which is great. Um, but we found we struggled with a few other PFS species, meaning uh, especially the FTSs. So our platform wasn't really getting consistent results compared to labs. Um, and we did, however, manage to successfully delineate the hotspots uh, in the fields. So the PFOS results looked really, really good. And you can go to the next slide for me, Richard. And we actually managed on the site to go to all these uh, blue locations first in the morning, in that first little panel there. So we did the blue locations. We found one location that had an elevated PFOS uh, result. And if we had just used the data that we had available to us, the hotspot would have been about the size of that red area. Um, but moving along, we did some further sampling, further delineating, and actually ended up reducing it down to the size of that small hotspot on the right. Uh, so we took the data from the morning, collected some more data in the afternoon, and by the end of the day, we shrunk the hotspot by a factor of 10. So you know, that's kind of the application of this instrument in delineation on size the same day. So that's soil example. The reason I don't have a water example is, and I was hoping to have a water example, is the detection limits. So detection in water is a bit harder by a factor of about a thousand. Uh, and obviously running an SPE uh, with an instrument like this is uh, quite challenging because we want to run as many samples as we can in a day and SPE slows it down. So SPE means solid phase extraction. For so I've got a flight taking off and there's a whole lot of people all around me. So it might get a bit more so. so application to water, uh, remote and time series testing using auto samplers and telemetry, so then we're looking in the future. So this is collecting ongoing data uh, and, and kind of having a profile of change in PFAS concentration. Source tracing is a really important application of this tool. Um, emergency response to spills, mass, mass flux assessments, particularly where there's a temporal factor and we need data over time. And then also water treatment optimization and validation. So that's another key use of this particular tool. Uh, we can have on to the next one. Uh, just before we do, I've been given a tip to advise the viewers to turn captions on. Um, so if you'd like to do that as viewers. I feel next. like a Monty Python skit. What was that? With subtitles. <laughs> I feel like a Monty Python skit with <laughs> subtitles. So... Um, that was an example of innovation where we could innovate because we had clear guidance in the policy. Oh, Should am I audible? Oh, there we go. There we go. So they seem to be done. So that was an example where we have high, higher regulatory certainty and we can innovate because we know where the goalposts are. This is an example where we have much lower regulatory certainty. So innovation is really hard because we don't know what the goalposts are. So we don't want to go and invent a technology and it works really, really well to find the detection that needs to be 10 times lower or 10 times higher or include different PFAS species. So organics is another key PFAS issue area. Uh, the PFAS are either associated with biosolids, kind of uh, anthropogenic background levels uh, or packaging that's frequently included in uh, makes its way into some of these waste streams. Um, background assessments and guideline values typically at the start of this uh, organics assessment period that's kind of been going on for the last three, four or five years uh, didn't exist. So we had some regulators providing regulation, but we didn't have the data to really know how that regulation or that value that they had selected came about, which I'll show in a second. So where there's this limited information, that regulation is typically really conservative. Uh, and unfortunately, when it's that conservative, uh, there's not common effects for industry. So we almost end up in a scenario where we have to choose between allowing PFAS into our compost or sending compost to landfill, which is obviously not good for climate action and the rest. 
So the uncertainty stifles our ability to, to essentially innovate and find ways of managing uh, PFAS and those feedstocks. We can move along to the next one. Sounds like Matt's got a fair bit of background noise right now. We'll just give it a sec. So there's quite a range of PFAS uh, in, in feeds in uh, organic feedstocks. So typically these are carboxylic acids, uh, medium short chain carboxylic acids, a few long chain. Yes, we get PFAS on the standard ones, but typically because of the places they come from, they are precursor degradation products. So, um, but there there is a wide range of them. Uh, as I mentioned, it quite often results in organics being diverted to landfill. Uh, and landfilling has obviously a lot of adverse outcomes aside from the climate, the climate issue and reducing methane and the rest during degradation. Probably the other one is that we've lost nutrients and uh, we've lost carbon, which our soil is so sorely in Australia. So the, the present you know, lack of clarity around how to manage uh, and how to test uh, and how to uh, regulate PFAS in organics is driving a lot of uncertainty and essentially sending this material to land for quite a bit. So head on to the next thing. Before we do that, Matt, so just the, the lack of uh, regulatory criteria, given how many compounds there are, you know, over 10,000 PFAS compounds, do you really see us getting clarity around that space anytime soon? Look, there is some guidance out there, but it's very uh, loose. I think the trouble now is Australia's in a position where we don't know from a PFAS perspective what's important. Do we manage the one microgram per kilogram? The biosolids and the, and the compost, do we focus on the contaminated biosolids? Uh, do we focus on our household carpets that have tens of thousands of micrograms per kilogram PFAS in them? So really what we need is a more coordinated effort to first think about what PFAS species are most predominant in Australia, uh, then which ones we're exposed to the most, so looking at exposure pathways, and not forget there's also an ecological aspect to this. Uh, then we also need to look at, from once we've identified a key list of these are the target PFAS that we're interested in because they're most prevalent, that's when we need to go and invest in toxicological studies. So the big gap right now is uptake uh, and the toxic, like toxicological risks. So we can't assess stuff if we don't know what what the uh, what the risk is, um, or at least what the chemical the profile of that chemical is from a toxicology perspective. And for a lot of these ten thousand PFAS species of speaker that we just don't know, the data simply doesn't exist, or it's very limited. Once we cover off on that, we know the risk, we know the prevalence, we know the likelihood that we get exposed. We can then get the risk factor, and we can do almost like a rank. How we can almost have a, you know, PFAS in biosolids or PFAS in soil or whatever it might be is public enemy number one. We attack them at first. And we can focus our regulatory tools there, and we can focus our innovation there as well. Yeah, no, it's sort of, it's cur I'm curious, given how much we already know about the problems with this group of compounds that. We feel the need to wait until we know the toxicity across the specific compounds to regulate it more closely. Well, and I, I think you know, to that point, some some regulators are applying the precautionary principle already uh, quite thoroughly, but that has other knock-on effects. So as I kind of mentioned, they're not waiting; they're going ahead and regulating. But it's resulting in uh, it's resulting in the compost example material going to landfill. So it's anti fentanyl On the one hand, we've got the waste policy uh, saying we will reuse 80, we'll reduce landfill you know, by 80% uh, by 2030. But then we've got other policies for natural PFAS with environmental objectives saying, well, you can't send, you know, uh, compost with PFAS in it out, so it has to go to landfill. So we've kind of got these two objectives that are anti fentanyl to each other and are fighting each other. So it's a very interesting time to be active in this. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Okay, next slide. So, well, based on this, um, based on this issue, we kind of set about creating a really high level strategy on okay, how will we help organics recyclers manage PFAS mass flow? Uh, so this was not so much about measuring it; it was more about measuring it when we needed to, uh, and having a really, really close 
uh, closed system that could control where PFAS was moving through and give regulators certainty. So we started off with a survey of the industry, moved on to kind of a literature and regulatory review and developed the tool to support them. So uh, really, this just really wanted to understand where is the mess coming from, where is it going to, and how can we manage that risk? And we can head on to the next slide. There's a lot of text on that. So survey studies, we looked at three things. We looked at what feedstocks were being accepted. Uh, the key kind of takeaway from this figure is, you know, lots of different facilities are receiving lots of different feedstocks. So no one of them is really the same. They all have a different fingerprint of where their material is coming from. And those different materials all have different PFAS profiles. Some have very little, so such as woody and timber waste, to some extent green organics as well. Others, like biosolids, some FOGO, paper waste, and commercial waste, they can potentially have a lot of PFAS depending on where it was sourced from. So what was said was there was no one feedstock that we could really go and say, if we take this out, everything will be fixed. There's multiple sources of PFAS to the organics industry. So we can head to the next, next slide. So the next thing we looked at is size. So the annual production, how big are these producers? And again, we found the range of size. So, um, so again, we found that all the producers are very different. So not only are they receiving lots of different feedstocks, but they're all different in scale. So what's suitable for one might be very unsuitable for another as far as uh, how onerous testing for PFAS might be based on cost, base, and turnover. So you can go to the next slide. And then lastly, we looked at end use. So where is where is their product going, essentially? And again, you can see a lot of them are really reliant on things like landscaping. Uh, some of them are involved more in agriculture or mine rehabilitation, and others are just going to consumers as potting mix. Okay, so again, it shows us that they're not all the same. They're similar in uh, but they are different, and that means they have different needs. And potentially, we shouldn't be classifying all compost in one way and assessing the mass flow in, the, in one way. So what do I mean by that is we can't assume that every bit of compost is going to end up in someone's garden growing their tomatoes when some of it might end up on a mine that's already quite contaminated and it's being used for minor rehabilitation. So we should stratify what we use rather than try have an unrestricted reuse with a very stringent guideline value and that will maximize how much organics material gets recycled. Next slide, thanks. Oh, we can skip that one. Um, so what did the literature tell us? In essence, the literature told us that there's a lot of PFAS in recycled organics, that it varies, uh, it's not all the same, um, but there are certain things that we can identify as key risks. So wherever food packaging was present alongside organics, so like in bins and whatnot, we found that there was 10 times more PFAS, roughly, uh, that there was a lot of precursors. So if we just looked at the standard PFAS suite, we wouldn't find terribly that much, but you could find orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude more running the precursor assessment TOPA. Um, the predominant species are PFCAs um, and typically increase at the very least by a factor of two. And then contaminants are enriched in the feedstock to actually lose quite a lot of mass of the solid uh, as water evaporates and CO2 is generated during the composting process. And then biosolids were also shown to be a major com contributor uh, with you know about 50% of the mass of PFAS underestimated if you just looked at your standard suite and didn't run a precursor analysis. So what does this say in a nutshell? It says there's the PFAS that we typically test for, but there's a whole lot of other stuff there. And if we're not looking at all of it, we can miss a large portion of the mass flow. So essentially, our feedstocks are complex. Um, but now looking to the future, we can't test everything. So it's impossible to try to test every kg of organics that goes, goes uh, through these systems. So the next question became, how do we rationalize this? Next slide, please. So this is an example of some data from what's the going FOGO in New South Wales. It was a test run by a New South Wales government. 
And basically what they found is here's a list of PFAS in FOGO, which is food organics and green organics versus just green organics. And you can see there's a wide suite of PFAS there with the carboxylic acid system table one being the most prevalent. Um, Richard, uh, it's very inconsiderate. <laughs> very inconsiderate of her, but yeah. I think soldier on. We've got a good audience. Yep. So, yeah, yeah, we'll keep moving. So, so looking at these these guidelines, you know, the, the table broadly shows that there's a range of low level PFAS in composts. Um, mm -hmm. There was another another study recently by Sivera um, that basically showed. Uh, in commercially available compost in Queensland, the PFAS concentrations are roughly less than 12.5 grams per kilogram, averaging around three grams per kilogram. Now, which I'll show you in a second, could be a problem. Uh, but if we contextualize that against other things, again, why are we like one microgram in compost when we've got such high concentrations of PFAS and other things? So I've given some examples there. Popcorn packaging, cleansing products, PFAS source sites. So, really, what I guess I'm trying to get uh, people to do is develop the problem holistically. Uh, so, we become too focused on the small compartmentalized areas. It's really hard to tell what's important. We spend a lot of public funding, uh, technical capital, that's my time, your time, chasing problems that are essentially not as big a problem for people as a mass from the perspective as we may perceive them to be. Next slide, Just before we do, so when when you do your analysis, it sounded like um, when we were talking to the previous slide that um, there was a high measurement of um, the total PFAS, but you could only identify about half of that in terms of as... What correct. specific compounds? Is that what you you meant there? Yeah, correct. So typically, this is what's been typically found across a whole bunch of the studies. So I mean, there's all sorts of methods out there, like high resolution mass spectrometry and whatnot, for going and actually identifying what these compounds are, and, we, and that could be done. But then it poses the next question of let's just if you make up a PFAS compound, just imagine something random that's not in you know, our standard list there that you can see on the slide. Um, if I find it and it's in a higher concentration, well, what do I do about it? If I don't have a guideline for it or any kind of ground of how toxic it is or how much I should be worried, what then what? So that's kind of the challenge at the moment is we have these large gaps where we actually don't know A, the transformation pathways, B, the prevalence. And then if we do figure those two out, then we get stuck on the toxicity. So it's not impossible, but it just makes life a little bit more difficult. Yeah, it, it seems we know quite a bit about how it accumulates in human bodies and things, I suppose. So. For certain species, yeah. Um, for other species, less so. And I think, again, one of the other challenges is I mentioned, like, you know, not compartmentalizing. It's the the other thing that get co gets compartmentalized is what about the ecological risks? So our, our guidelines for ecological exposure whether you agree with them or not in Australia, are actually really low for, especially for aquatic environments. So we have a notoriously low, low guideline value for aquatic environments. So the problem looks different if you're assessing it from a human health perspective versus an ecological perspective. Yeah, it seems we're in a real dilemma, which is we just don't have the capacity to analyse the toxicity of all of these compounds, but we're being asked to manage it because we've got a pretty good gut feel that it's a real problem. Is that right? I'd say that's accurate. But I think, you know, what you need is, a, as I mentioned earlier, a more coordinated approach to, you know, how we prioritise which PFAS we're going to address. Uh, we're looking at three, the US drinking water guidelines at five. Some people can say, why aren't we looking at these ones as well? Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of figuring out to still be done. I think people are getting, Frustrated and bored with PFAS, they're going, oh, I'm supposed to get with PFAS. But uh, when I look at PFAS, I still see that there's a, a bucket load of work to be done to adequately manage them. They might be bored with it, but it might be the biggest problem we've got, right? Um, yeah, but I think also we have to contextualize it against other continents. So, you know, uh, I'd, I'd be more worried with arsenic or cyanide or something in my water than it would be with PFAS. So, we can't forget about the other things that we have to manage as well. And um, PFAS, at the end of the day, is just a contaminant. 
it's not special. It's just a new thing that we're figuring out right now. Just like there were uh, other contaminants, other pesticides, PCBs, and sorts of things in the decades past. Yeah. It's just a contaminant. I've just been reading a bit about what we do know in terms of how it is affecting uh, people, etc. So, yeah, I guess it's it's a special contaminant in that it's so prevalent. We do. I'll move to the next slide. Is that the... They're the guidelines. So I've got two different guidelines. They're ones from the NEMF 3.0 and the other ones from... Uh, from ERA 53, which is a Queensland guideline for compost. Why have I put that up there? Well, as soon as we start having some of calculations, like that third row down for ERA 53 and a sum of three, you might have heard me mention prior that the average PFAS in compost in that prior study in Queensland was three micrograms per kilogram. But the guideline is also three micrograms per kilogram. So on average, the compost in Queensland, for example, will exceed the guideline. So the trouble that we have here is even in our cleanest feedstocks, FOGO and green waste, never mind biosolids, we're struggling to meet the guideline value. So what hope, hope do we have with biosolids and industrial organics uh, if we can't meet it in our cleaner feedstocks? So we have a scenario now where, yes, we're trying to do the right thing, find the precautionary principle, protect the environment, but the net outcome is our industries, like the organics industry, suffer, and this material uh, goes to landfill. Now we've changed the mass flow from going from the waste generators to being a part of field to going to a landfill and it's each other. So we've moved the mass flow, but we haven't achieved which the PFAS. So long story short, to manage this, we just came up with a simple model. Uh, the model essentially was let's test all our feedstocks uh, in the initial sense. So we'll, we classify things as low risk or high risk. Low risk would be something like what these people, these uh, organics processes receive all the time, which might be, I don't know, stubble from a farmer or uh, green waste or something like that. We know is relatively low risk and we suggest you test it on a six monthly basis, but you don't have to test it all the time. Or we classify things as high risk and we said, we don't know enough about this or it's a high risk feedstock. You should probably test it every time you receive it. Uh, so that helped minimize the cost burden of managing it. So if they had stuff that was business as usual, they just did kind of QA testing, whereas they had some, you know, Joe Blog shop with some material they haven't seen before, uh, they would actually test it. Um, we then created this very simple model that can be used backwards or forwards, forwards to basically calculate if you're receiving a new material, what the impact on the final product would be after the composting process, or backwards to figure out what your acceptance criteria should be for materials on the basis of the latent PFAS coming in, kind of background PFAS in the material that you routinely receive. So it's not very complicated, but at least gave uh, a mechanism to help organics recyclers decision make. So, so just a simple way of tracing mass flow. So that analysis you're doing of those feedstocks, that's just a total PFAS number, isn't it? Correct. So what it doesn't take into, it doesn't take into account risk and it doesn't take into account leachability. Uh, all it is is to go, we rule of thumb no under our licensing conditions without X amount in our compost. If I receive this 10 tons of this material from Joe Blogs, it's going to put me over that number. Or vice versa, the other way around. What number can I give out to my clients that says don't receive anything over this? Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact is, Richard, most of this material has some level of PFAS. It might be very, very low, uh, but it's most material that we're dealing with these days in this industry has some kind of PFAS contamination in it. So it doesn't necessarily mean there's any risk, but it's present. Yeah. So it's really a, it's a, just a coarse measure to try and understand total mass coming in of PFAS from any particular Correct. feedstock. It, it's more of a framework, yeah. Yeah. You can head over to the next slide. So where this kind of tied in with things now is we had kind of a complete way that we proposed that these organic recyclers could manage uh, the, the PFAS mass flows. And this was around having that uh, that framework that I just showed you, the feedstock management plan, uh, having QA testing on the products, but then having a broader PFAS management plan for the site, which looks at stuff like how do they manage leachate, how do they manage waste, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
But in essence, the goal was to provide them with a holistic beginning to end the kind of approach to managing ethos and making sure that they had a way to control what was entering and exit their their, compa uh, their compost. And more importantly, show the regulator, give the regulator confidence uh, that the material that they were receiving and the products they were producing were fit for purpose. Now, there's still a lot of challenges that we only, in some states, don't have any compost kind of guidelines. In other states, we have a single number that's for restrict unrestricted use, meaning a lot of the compost won't pass that number. Um, so we still have some work to do in that, that extent. But you can see from what I've just presented, one, the soil that we spoke about earlier in the portable well seems that was a very technical solution because we knew the goalposts we're trying to get to. In this particular case, we presented and it's a bit more framework and broad and less tangible because we don't really know the goal we're trying to reach to. So this is the extent of the innovation that we can do right now. I can't, even if I could create a technology tomorrow that can remove PFAS from compost, the question is, how much do I need to remove? Is it all of it? Uh, so this is the extent of the innovation we can do right now with the current uncertainties in the regulatory space and in the technical sphere as well as the state of knowledge. And that's the next slide. Just before we do, so in the context of the general environmental duty, if I'm a manufacturer of compost and I've got these various feedstocks and you've done this mass sort of study and you've worked out certain feedstocks have more PFAS than others, do I meet my general environmental duty by reducing those high PFAS stocks? Oh, good question. I mean, you, you can definitely demonstrate the what is practicable, but I mean, since you don't have a level or an extent that you, that's considered safe for a lot of them, or safe is probably the wrong word, acceptable in the environment, that'll pose its own challenges. So uh, I think that's still quite a gray area. Again, if I pick a random PFAS, uh, let's say PFMA, uh, and I've got it at higher levels on my flight, I think under your environmental duty, you would need to manage that. Uh, it's not meant to be there, and it presents a potential risk. And if we can't characterize that risk, then we need to apply the precautionary principle and basically assume that it will cause a risk and we need to manage it. Uh, so it's a, it's actually a very hard question to answer. And the short answer is, ends up being, it depends. <laughs> All right. Um, it seems this precautionary principle is going to cause um, real problems moving forward and maybe the sort of principles of the general environmental duty might create a more practical way to move towards a better you know outcome to continue to use those streams that's just a pondering so basically all this slide really says is we use something like plcms as a technology uh very successfully in the field to improve something that we do routinely. So we routinely currently manage or measure PFAS in soil across the country using more traditional methods. We knew the goalposts. We created something inventive or innovative uh, to go and do this slightly better than what was currently available. So, you know, under the environment, if you like, where we have known goalposts and well understood regulation to some degree, we could go innovate. If you go to the next slide, Richard. Conversely, in the organics example, where there's so much uncertainty, we've done the best we can by creating a framework, but we actually can't innovate further than that at the moment because we don't know where the goalposts are. We don't know to what extent we need to manage that material. Uh, we still have more questions than answers. So no, if you think of it as an innovation of an investment, no one's going to invest in something if they don't know what they're going to do is going to be useful. And that's really the crux of it. So if we want to be able to innovate in the space, we need to have those goalposts more clearly set. And that regulatory lag, and I admit that regulating PFAS is quite a lot of really difficult because there's so much uncertainty, but that regulatory lag really impedes um, how we can innovate in the industry and manage PFAS. In Australia, what are the regulators doing in terms of establishing those criteria? We have a number of devices. Um, Starting right at the beginning, uh, we've got iChems now to stop PFAS coming in, or at least a certain suite of PFAS, uh, so to reduce how much enters the environment. Uh, conversely, we also have a PFAS lamp, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, which provides some high level federal guidance. Uh, and that trickles down into our state governments who then adopt that lamp differently. So, well, if we done well, most of our states are stuff around soil management. Uh, we adopt health criteria 
uh, into our drinking water, like into the Safe Drinking Waters Act to make sure we're not drinking PFAS. Uh, but where we're not doing well is we have all these other things. So PFAS in concrete, PFAS in compost, PFAS in uh, asphalt. Um, well, we're not quite sure what to do in the guidance isn't as clear as, as, it, should, as, as it should be yet. Uh, and then if you throw the circular economy in there, we're reusing stuff in all sorts of new ways. Again, it's even more unclear of where does PFAS fit in that? How do we manage it? What's appropriate? So it seemed to me you had a slide up a while ago, Matt, that was about uh, just the different sort of concentrations and popcorn packaging seemed to be extremely high and cosmetics um is it as simple as saying well let's start there and reduce what's just coming the the composition of pfas in those products start start right at that end yeah and there's lots of work happening in that sphere across you know the us australia parts of europe um it's a starting point but we also have other inputs right? so obviously nothing notorious the fire ID phones um, but that only represents a percentage of the entire PFAS input. So the PFAS problem sits with consumer products uh, and industry. So it's in our carpets, it's in our textiles, um, it's in our packaging. Uh, it's across so many different things that it's really hard to separate. What are the important uses, like medical uses? Uh, what are the uses where we have no possible replacement and we have to decide, do we just deliver them or do we not? And that's something that makes people quite uncomfortable. As well as, lastly, uh, you know, where are we using it that we could just completely eliminate? So, yes, we should absolutely eliminate it where we can, but that's very easily said, very hard to do. Um, and, you know, that means looking at uh, products coming in from overseas, what we're allowed to be manufactured and used in Australia. So that's part of what ICANN's role is in the future. Um, but that is still, you know, still under the, the ICANN's Act. That's still something that they're busy building. You know, it's going through public consultation. So there's work to be done there. All right, um, just moving on, I'm going to skip over what I was going to present on because Matt's on a tight time frame and I'm conscious there's some good questions in the q and A. I I just um, very briefly say that with these PFAS mass flux studies that uh, in terms of collecting that sort of data you need to calculate that, um, you can use these sort of auto samplers connected to telemetry and they'll give you a good first flush sampling that's normally where your heaviest loads of PFAS are. Um, so you can get a hydrograph and you can collect those samples and get the concentrations of PFAS from your lab analysis. So that's another way to get this flux approach worked out. Um, various ways to configure them in drains, uh, open channels, et cetera, to collect that sort of data. So that's an example of a flow sensor connected to telemetry that's triggering an auto sampler that's in that um, <clears throat> cylindrical shaped device there. Um, that's probably enough on that. Matt, you still there? I certainly am, just checking where my flight's leaving. Okay. We also get a lot of questions about groundwater sampling for PFAS. So we do have a range of different sorts of sampling devices that are PFAS free. So um, people seem to get very concerned about cross-contamination. That's fair enough, but there are a lot of options there for sampling groundwater to make sure you're not getting that cross-contamination. So the lessons learned from Matt, mass flux is critical for categorizing and managing PFAS risks in the absence of clear criteria and regulation determining risks is challenging. Let's move to the questions. Okay, first question was from Simon Tremlett. Was FTIR considered as an alternative to MS for direct analysis? Um, not in the field for us. Uh, so the single quad MS it does have its limitations, um, but we've been we've been pretty successful with that. And from a sample prep and separation kind of perspective, the LCMS just made a lot of sense. 
Um, I'm aware there are a whole heap of other analysis te techniques out there. So there's Piggy, yeah, there's FTR and NMR techniques. Um, but this was technology that was readily available. Uh, and for us as well, it allowed us to use our existing um, laboratory techniques and just modify them. So I'm sure there's other ways that you could do this for an in-field method, but no, we haven't done FTR. If there are any examples, and if you want to send me anything that you've seen of it being used, I'm more than happy to engage with that because I'm always curious what other people are doing. Uh, we actually have a um, uh, study going with RMIT at the moment with um, one of their students, Luke, Denarchus, who's looking at exactly that, all the different options for PFAS analysis continuously in the field. So, Perfect. Uh, I'll send some stuff through on that when we've finished it. Next questions from Peter Stevens. Will NEMP3 assist with understanding limits? Um, I, I hope so. Uh... Look, the PFAS and M3 uh, consultation draft is out there. It's helpful, but at the end of the day, it's a guidance document. So it's not a regulatory document. It does get adopted by the by the various states and territories. Um, so it'll yes, it'll help, but at the end of the day, it'll be your state or territory authority that actually decides what's appropriate and what's not appropriate uh, for what's jurisdiction. And it sounds like they're a fair way off. Is that fair to say? I think, look, it varies state to state. Uh, some are a bit more progressive, um, but yeah, I think there's still a heap of work to do. So just on that, in terms of an operator having clarity on when there's going to be criteria, are we sort of talking five years, 10 years? What, how long do you think? Any idea? Probably, probably not that long, um, but I'm aware of work happening across the states at the moment, doing exactly what I said, collecting specifically for compost as an example, uh, collecting background levels. We've had some studies in Victoria looking at soil and, uh, and rivers. We've had studies in Queensland. So we are in that process, um, but it's probably still another five-year journey before we get to a point, like with soil, where we're relatively comfortable with how to manage PFAS in all these different matrices. Yeah. Next question is from Kieran Harford. Do slug tests have a role in measuring the spread of PFAS plumes in aquifers? Well, I would say yes, slug tests are you know, used for uh, determining K-values and movements of water. And if we, you know, we maybe not directly for measuring PFAS itself, but if we know what PFAS is in the water and we understand how the hydrology of the site through slug testing and all the rest, uh, I guess the challenge is putting things down wells uh, where you have trace contaminants like PFAS and you're at risk of uh, contaminating that site. But there's, there's ways to do it that you know reduce that risk significantly. And uh, we've done some stuff testing recently on one of our sites. There was PFAS impacted. So I'd uh, be keen to hear if anyone has anything contrary to that. I'm surprised. You're, so you're putting an actual slug of PFAS into the aquifer? So oh, saying? no, 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 no. Just the slug as in the solid thing to displace the water. Yeah. That's what, okay. No. So you're not using it as a tracer. All right. Um, yeah, so to answer that question, slug tests are always pretty valuable in terms of understanding your hydraulic characteristics of your aquifer. So that would apply to any, any plume you're trying to predict where it's going to go. Um, Luke Denarchus. Hello, Luke. Given we tend to see PFAS magnify in wastewater treatment plants and the potential for further contamination through effluent disposal and use, do you think that wastewater treatment plans will be the battle front for monitoring and management and regulatory control? So waste in general is where we aggregate all our contaminants, whether it's landfill leachate, wastewater treatment plants, uh, recycled you know, recycled organics and those kind of operators. So yes, I think the, the contamination management places of the future are landfills, wastewater treatment plants, all those places where we send the stuff we don't want. Okay, so several battlegrounds, Luke, I think is uh, the answer. 
Anonymous attendee, let's set up a funding page for next time so Dr. Matt can sit in the quiet space on the Qantas Lounge. It's a good tip. There you go, Matt. We'll uh, start that fundraising for next one, given Matt's going to jump on a plane soon. Um, Very much. Ben Carr, solutions. Don't compost biosolids and reduce contamination levels in FOGO that is composted. I wish it was that simple. Uh, that does fix a lot of the problem, uh, but not necessarily all of it. Because they're not readily biodegradable, is that what you're saying? Oh, and there's also background PFAS in a lot of a lot of things that you think it wouldn't be in. So, you know, you can receive a load of cut grass and not know that it came from a PFAS impacted site. So still end up with uh, contamination. Okay, next question. Brian Fainton, do you think we should aspire to a TEQ similar to what we have for benzoapyrene for PFAS? Do you see this happening or is the toxicity data too far off? I, I think it will happen at some point. Uh, there's lots of talk around this specific thing at the moment. So that's a good point raised by Brian. Um, I still think we're a little way off, yes, but I do know that there's lots of work happening. And it's actually a topic that's covered in the PFAS NAM 3.0. Uh, there's still some debates about what's appropriate. So there was a couple of papers published on this recently as well. I think one was published... Uh, by Carl Wells and a few other people. So there's there's lots of discussion, lots of debate. Uh, I think ultimately, yes, if I had to put my money behind someone, I think that's where we may end up. All right. Next question, Carl Bowles. Not, it's not just a contaminant. PFAS are a family of many thousands of contaminants with extremely diverse properties both physiochem and toxicological, the diversity matters for regulation and management. Well, I mean, well, you... Carl, that's a comment, not a, not a question, but he's also he's also right. Um, you know, I think saying PFAS is about as useful as saying pesticides. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very broad group. It, it you know, it's emerging in a wide range of areas, matrices. Uh, with a wide range of, you know, uh, different toxic modes, uptakes uh, into organisms, into humans. So it is it is actually a very complex problem. It is incredibly difficult to regulate. And uh, when we don't get it right, we either become too protective, like overprotective or underprotective, uh, and either industry or people suffer, uh, or alternatively, you know, we expose the environments of humans to harmful chemicals. So it is a really, really delicate balance. Yeah, it's a good point. I guess we start off with just a generic number and then move to trying to work out the toxicity of all the compounds. Martin O'Rourke, given that there are 10,000 plus PFAS chemicals out there, are every single one of these man-made? Why are there so many? Are there naturally occurring ones? What PFAS is there in popcorn packaging? I'd like to know that one too. Is it dangerous? How did it get there? Is it necessary? That's a lot of questions. So the, the short version, because I hand it off the phone in a minute, Richard. Um, the short answer to that is PFAS are really good at what they do. Uh, they're good at repelling oil, repelling grease, repelling water. Uh, there's various formulations that have been used. So the chemical companies are clever. Uh, when one gets banned, they can change the formulation slightly. And when it gets in, it essentially has a similar structure and a similar functionality, but it's not technically the same chemical as far as its cast number or its identification is concerned. Um, and noting that, though, if it has those physiochemical properties that make it great at repelling water and all the things that PFAS do, typically it has a similar toxicity because it's, you know, it's like, like and like. So that's the first part of that. The second part of that is that's why it's in popcorn packaging and other, other packaging because it repels grease uh it's it's incredibly useful and incredibly effective at that uh, the particular one in that study that i shared was uh, a fluorotelium alcohol i can't remember exactly what it was or what the concentration was off the top of my head it was about twelve thousand. um but it's, it's in other packaging as well 
particularly in some recycled packaging, there's some PFAS called DIPAPs uh, that are quite prevalent and they are precursors where they degrade into other shorter chain PFAS species. It's a good I question. To all the questions. Yeah, the, the question of is is it necessary? It's sort of like you know you talk about oh it's good at repelling grease and stuff. Well, you know, does it really matter if the packaging's a bit greasy? I was just thinking. Uh, well, I mean that becomes a convenience question. Yeah, exactly. very comfortable. I, I don't think I'm qualified to uh, enter into the <laughs> psychology of humans and whether the things we do are uh, acceptable for the convenience we gain from them. Okay, we'll say that's out I have to run, Richard. Okay, um, thank Apologies. you very much for doing today. We thought we'd give it a go. So many thanks to the audience. Um, what we might do is re-record the actual presentation so the audio is clearer and we'll have that available for everyone. But Matt, thanks very much for doing that. I think it was a great success and uh, really appreciate you. Okay finding the time thank you very much cheers thank you everybody we're actually going to end five minutes early i think this is a record but um thanks everybody for attending really appreciate it